Hey Magic Community on YouTube, T1 Glister Elf here. Welcome to my first AMA for 2020. Uh, this is a rework. I apologize for the delay. Uh, there was rain in the background of uh, the last one I made, and it made the audio unsalvageable, unfortunately. That does mean that instead of getting live video of Evangeline playing with me while I answer questions, you get old video of Evangeline playing with me <laughs> elsewhere. So, shoutouts to Evangeline, and shoutouts to Rukulin for all the questions you sent in. Uh, I see, we'll start off with your first one. What's your stance on White's power in recent magic history? Rukulin, that's T1 Reese the Redeemed. So, White. Ooh, so I, I mentioned that there's been an ironic, not a serious, it's a silly, storm and brew in between Craig Wesco, legitimately one of my favorite players of the game, and April King, legitimately one of my favorite memers of the game. <laughs> it's not serious by any stretch of the imagination, but Craig is, of course, Mr. White Weenie. Mr. White has to be in every deck he plays. And April, not so much. <laughs> White has had... A storied history, I'm sure. White started out really powerfully. When you think white in the beginning of Magic's history, you think cards like Swords to Plowshares for creature removal. One mana, creature exiling, but with a downside, albeit not one that really matters. You think Balance, something that deals with creatures and lands. You think Armageddon, something that deals with lands. Uh, you think cards like those. White started out with that being part of its identity, but those are really powerful things, and those had to be toned down. Uh, over time, white has had its powerful options taken more away, or given to other colors, and that's left white with something of an identity crisis. When you think of white in the game, you're probably going to think of white weenie, small creatures that can swarm the field, usually, uh, Powerful control effects, like Wrath, see Wrath of God, Fumigate, etc. And Hate Bears, Thalia Guardian of Thraben, Thalia Heretic Cathar, uh, Cat Jesus, <laughs> Leon and Arbiter, those sorts of things. And that's about it. White's removal is no longer as good as the other colors, green notwithstanding. <laughs> Blue gets counter spells, black gets kill spells, red gets damage spells, white gets to think of a, a relatively recent one that was useful, uh, Deck and Stone, a two-mana sorcery speed exiling card that also lets them draw cards. I mean, it's not great. It's, it's not a fatal push. Uh, so, green has been getting a lot of pushed creatures. L white of light has not. Um, card draw, White has a very specific way of doing it. It's, you have weak creatures that come into play, and you can draw off of them. Say, Mentor of the Meek, for instance. Or then occasionally, something like Wall of Omens. Uh, whereas Blue gets to do that all the time, and now Green gets to do that, and Black gets to do that if it loses life, and Red gets to do it if it discards, and so on. White has had... Uh, it's, it's lost what it was really special at, in my estimation, and is becoming... Uh, less good at what it is still left doing. Now, there's, there's not a whole lot that they can do, in my estimation, to really make white a lot stronger, without, or to make it more iconic without making it a lot stronger. <laughs> You're not going to see another Path to Exile printed. You're not going to see another Swords to Plowshares. Its removal is always going to be uh, subpar or conditional or have something like that. Having a downside like your opponent gets a land is still too strong, for instance. Uh, white is going to be all about those white weenie creatures. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but that seems to be the direction it's been for so long that I I'm sort of expecting that to continue being the case. And so on. I mean... <laughs> I love me some hate bears. That's maybe my favorite thing about white. Uh, but those are also really unfun to play against. So making really strong white hate bears isn't something that they can do too much. And so on. Poor white. Alright. Uh, <laughs> next. So your next question. Seeing your Hatsune Miku shirt again, what music do you listen to? That's a good question. The short answer is I don't very much anymore. 
But that's not a very interesting answer, so I'll try to give a little bit more. Uh, I do have that, that stereotype of, I listen to classical music and metal. <laughs> you, you may hear that a good bit. <laughs> About as common as, I like all music except country and rap, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, when I'm on the road home, uh, I'll turn on some NPR or, what, or GPB, Georgia Public Radio, and I'll listen to whatever classical music is playing on the way in. Uh, if I get a chance, I do really like metal. My favorite band is Tourisos, and Nightwish is up there too, so opera metal. Uh, I don't listen to it as much as I used to because I find that when I write, I can't be as productive when I'm listening to music. I'm focusing on that as well. I can't help it. Uh, when I'm editing, I need audio from what I'm editing rather than music in the background. And I work a lot, so I just don't get to listen. I, it's just how it is, I suppose. Uh, when I get a chance, I have some guilty pleasures. I played DDR a lot back in the day, so DDR music is always a great way to get me pumped. Uh, video game OSTs and remixes when I get the chance. Shoutouts to Bit Brigade and Athens, Georgia band that uh, makes video game music <laughs> in a in a chip tune, like in an 8-bit or 16-bit style. Uh, their big claim to fame is that they will play through an OST while a speedrunner is actually running a game, so like Mega Man 2, for instance, or Castlevania. They'll actually be playing live while the speedrun is going on, and it's super cool to watch. I said Athens, Georgia. I went to school in Athens, Georgia, so... <laughs> yeah, they're great. And also, shoutouts to Lobos Jr. for featuring them on his stream for the longest time. It's a Dark Souls runner. Uh, runner. Streamer. There we go. Soulsborn. A FromSoft streamer. There we go. Um, let's see. Do I have any plans to teach Evangeline MTG? Yes. There is a video that's a few years old on the channel. It's me showing off a deck that I plan to have be Evangeline's first magic deck. Now, it's very, very simple. It's, I believe, called uh, Murgonda Petroglyph. Or Green-White Petroglyphs, something like that. It's based on the card Murgonda Petroglyphs. Creatures without an ability get plus two, plus two. All of the creatures in her deck do not have abilities. I can basically just tell her all you need to focus on are the numbers for power and toughness and the mana cost, and we can build up from there. Once she knows what Murgonda Petroglyphs does, uh, just she knows to add two to each. <laughs> Uh, and then, it, other than that, there's vanilla creatures and tokens, and I can probably explain to her what the tokens do. Uh, aside from that, she and I actually have already played some magic before. I, ha I gave her the bear deck, all the creatures are tutus, for two, and I gave myself the fugitive wizard deck, all the creatures are one ones. No abilities on anything! <laughs> I, they're, they're not actually 60 card decks, they're I don't even remember. Uh, but basically, she gets to just destroy me every time, and we get to, you know, go over the numbers, explain how this works, explain math to her. She and I have already played that a bit. I probably should record that. I should probably show you. So far, I don't think I've gotten any anything terribly useful yet. It takes a while. <laughs> we, we work through it. It takes a while. It probably wouldn't be too interesting yet. Uh, but one day, one day, you will get to see. So, in other words, starting off, starting off with, you know, vanilla cards. Easy enough. And then, you had a question, it was originally too late, but I had to do a re-record, so here we go. Uh, do you have any experience with D&D &D or other tabletop RPGs? Sister, you have no idea. <laughs> I ran a radio show when I was at the University of Georgia. Shoutouts to WUOG. Occasionally you'll see that shirt. Uh, I, I'll wear that every now and then. And uh, I ran... It, the show was called Parties and Parodies. It was a Dungeons and Dragons radio drama. We ran for a season for them. was half a year. It was a semester. So we ran for eight seasons. We were four years on the air. Running our own campaign. And it was great. It was the greatest extracurricular activity I have ever ever done. <laughs> it's not even close. I got to be the DM the whole time, and we had a rotating cast. The The fewest we ever had at a time, I think, were three, counting myself. The most 
episodes, nine, it, it was a lot. I still have my old episodes uh, on my computer. Uh, the audio is is going to have to be worked on before they are worth presenting, unfortunately. Uh, and I would absolutely, if I put them on YouTube, get copyright claimed because of some of the background music. Without a doubt. <laughs> but one of these days, I might put up an episode. I might. Just to, just to relive the good old days. Or to show off a little bit. I thought it was great. I thought it was fun. We had a good old time. Uh, my favorite season. We, we change it up every season. Uh, the odd-numbered ones were all w us playing our regular adventures in our regular campaign. The even-numbered ones were all offshoots. <laughs> and uh, let's see. My favorite one was season two. Are you ready to just have your ears start bleeding? This is about to be the most annoying voice you've ever heard in your life. All of the kobolds in the show, which are like goblins but more lizardy, I guess. All of the kobolds sounded like this the entire time. So we just cut off our nasal canal and it sounded like this. Uh, so a little like Stitch, but not with a sound like this. Just doing that voice puts me in a great mood. Imagine an entire season where the characters, as long as they're talking in character, sound like that. We had people listen to the show. I don't know how they put up with that. The joys of public radio, we got away with that. Granted, the time slot was midnight to three, so... <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess no one was listening. No one who, no one who cared. All right, all right. So that's it. That's it. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, if you want to become a patron, if you want to get some questions in on these, by all means, uh, other little announcements. I am 65 pages <laughs> into my in effect guide. Man, it started out as like a, a light primer and a sideboard guide for each format, and it is growing and growing. It's it's mission creep. That's what it is. As I write more, it makes me find more things to write. This is just straight up going to be a book by the time it's done. Uh, shout out to Stephen Menendian for writing Understanding Gush. An entire book written on a single card, Gush, his favorite card. Uh, well, I'm writing a book about Infect, my favorite mechanic. I legitimately think that I could write a book on just Glistener Elf. I think I could actually do that. <laughs> but no, I'm going to give you a little bit more than that. I'll, I'll give you the... <laughs> you get a Glistener Elf book, and then as a bonus, you get everything else about Infect. All right, everyone. Take care, Magic Community, and I will see you all later. Bye-bye. Oh, she found me. You found me, Evangeline.